For the first chapter, we will cover a broad range of topics, then get into more detail about these ideas in subsequent chapters. Also be aware that these slides have been converted from a four majors version of biology and therefore will sometimes fall in an order that does not follow the online textbook for non-majors. A strong suggestion for your success in this course, as mentioned in the welcome video, before you read the chapter is to look at the section objectives. These will help you recognize key ideas and make them pop as you read. For example, by the end of chapter one, section one, you should be able to identify and describe the properties of life, describe the levels of organization among living things, and list examples of different subdisciplines in biology. Knowing these points before you read will help you pull out the key ideas in each section. Biology is the science of living organisms, but what is categorized as a living thing? Are cells living? Are viruses living? There are several characteristics an organism must exhibit to be considered a living organism. For an organism to be considered living, it must exhibit at some point in its life all of these characteristics. Organisms will be organized, they will respond to internal or external stimuli. They'll reproduce to sustain the species. They'll adapt, grow and develop, regulate bodily functions, transfer energy, and eventually evolve for survivability. Let's look at these characteristics a little more closely. When we consider order, organisms on Earth range from simple one-celled bacterium that may only live a few hours to enormous complex organisms that live for hundreds of years like trees or turtles. Living organisms are also sensitive to a stimulus. Plants are known to grow toward a light source. Birds will fly away at a sudden sound and snakes will move into the sun to warm up. Movement is also a stimulus that will result in a change to an organism. For example, if a fly lands on a Venus flytrap plant, the plant will respond to the fly's motion. This video shows how sensitive the plant is and how lucky a fly could be depending on how it moves about on the plant. If the video does not open, it is linked for you in Blackboard. Two more characteristics that are important for living organisms include reproduction and growth and development. Organisms must reproduce in order to pass on genetic information to future generations. This reproduction happens asexually, meaning without a partner in single-celled organisms, such as bacteria, by splitting the parent cell into two daughter cells, which then split into four and so forth. Sexual reproducing organisms require a partner. In this form, one of the pair will provide ovum or an egg, while the other provides the sperm. Also, these offspring will grow, which is getting bigger, while development entails changing over a lifetime. Finally, any living organism must regulate processes to supply the body with necessary components such as nutrients, oxygen, removing waste, and temperature control. Conditions within the body can change due to external changes, and therefore the body must adjust conditions back to a normal level. This is known as homeostasis or maintaining a steady state within the, bo within the body. Many organisms have adaptations to help survive extremes, such as the polar bear who has the ability to conserve heat and handle excessively low temperatures. All energy comes from the sun. It's converted by plants and then transferred again by either consumers or eventually decomposers. More on this in a few minutes. For organisms to survive generation after generation, they need to be considered fit for their environment. Animals which can handle the conditions of an environment are most likely to survive and thereby reproduce. These organisms will pass their DNA on to future generations. Over many generations, one species may evolve into one or even more than one other species. Sometimes evolution occurs as a result of mutations, random chance changes in DNA. While some evolutionary changes will increase fitness in a population, some evolutionary changes can be detrimental to the success of a species. 
Looking at these two bones, which are of similar structures in a human and an eagle, the eagle's bone evolved over time to be mostly hollow to, the, to allow the bird to be lightweight enough to fly. Returning to the idea of order, living organisms are highly structured. Even the most simple single-celled organisms have a defined structure and specific genetic code which makes them unique from all other organisms on the planet. This hierarchy of atoms to the biosphere is what makes life so complex. Each layer builds to form the next in living organisms. Looking at cells, which are the smallest unit of life, atoms and molecules are not alive, there are two major types. Prokaryotes, which are single-celled and do not have a nucleus, and eukaryotes, which are mostly multicellular and also have a nucleus in the cell. While all cells have DNA for reproducing, eukaryotic cells' DNA is found in that nucleus. An easy way to remember the difference between these two cells is pro-no and eu-nu, as in prokaryotes have no nucleus and eukaryotes have a nucleus. Quickly, although the online book does not cover this, I want to briefly review a few points regarding energy. Remember that all energy on Earth is from the sun. Energy cannot be created nor destroyed, only transferred. Plants take the sun's energy and convert it to usable plant-style energy through photosynthesis. Any energy that is not used is released into the environment as heat. Plants that absorb the sun's energy and convert it are referred to as producers or autotrophs, cell feeders, as they can produce their own energy via photosynthesis. Photosynthesis converts solar energy into sugars that the plant uses to grow. This process requ requires carbon dioxide from the atmosphere, water from the ground, plus the sun's light energy. In turn, the plant produces glucose and releases oxygen, which then we breathe. Organisms which cannot produce their own energy via photosynthesis must obtain or consume energy from another source. These are known as consumers or heterotrophs, meaning they feed from other sources. There are three main levels. Organisms which only eat plants, known as herbivores, such as rabbits. They're also known as primary consumers. Then anything that eats a primary consu consumer is called a secondary consumer. These organisms can be straight carnivores, such as a fox, or they could be omnivores that eat both plants and animals, such as a bear. Then there is the tertiary or third level consumer, which are strictly carnivores, such as a tiger. Once all of the energy has traveled from the sun, through the plants, through the various consumers, eventually there is something left behind, a dead plant or the remains of an animal. This is where decomposers are important. They further break down the organism, releasing nutrients back into the ground to be used again by plants. You know the plants can convert solar energy into usable glucose or sugar through photosynthesis, but how does that sugar get into the actual cells of the plant to work, allowing the plant to perform, perform all of the necessary functions to maintain life? It is through this process called cellular respiration. Animals, including humans, also perform this to get energy to the cells to do work. Notice the formula is backwards from photosynthesis. Without evolution, there would be no diversity among species and due to the endless species of organisms across the globe, scientists developed a system of categorizing all these species. A binomial or two name system has been used since the 18th century for identifying species. It uses structures, functions, and behaviors for classifying all known organisms. A partial classification of the species Canis lupus is shown.
However, as genome research has increased over the past several decades, scientists are beginning to utilize phylogenetic trees, which can identify genetic similarities and differences. A broad phylogenetic tree is shown separating the three domains of life. These three domains are bacteria, archaea, and eukarya. The first two only have prokaryotic cells, which are, remember, the cells without a nucleus. The domain is also the kingdom, meaning the second level of hierarchy. Eukarya has all the eukaryotic cells or cells with a nucleus. Remember, pro no, eu nu. Eukarya has four kingdoms. The protists, which are the slimes and the algae type organisms, plantae, which are all the plants, fungi, which includes yeast, molds, and mushrooms, and animalia, which of course is all animals, including humans. There are so many branches of biology. Molecular biologists study genetics and other molecular level processes. Microbiologists study structure and functions of organisms requiring a microscope. Paleontology, neurobiology, biotechnologists, environmentalists, and physiologists are all different type of biologists which spe specialize in a sub-discipline of biology. And for the last topic of Chapter 1, any science course needs to understand the steps of the scientific method. There are several steps. So looking at the flowchart to the right, first, a scientist would observe something that would raise a question. This question would lead to a hypothesis to suggest an explanation to the question. Then the scientist would design an experiment to test that hypothesis or that suggested explanation. Once the experiment was completed and data was collected, the scientist would analyze the data and draw a conclusion. If the hypothesis was supported by the results, the scientist would share those results. However, if the experiment failed to support the hypothesis, the scientist would rework the hypothesis and redesign the experiment and run it again. As mentioned in the previous slide, a hypothesis is a suggested explanation. A good hypothesis will have several components. It will be reasonable. It will be capable of being tested repeatedly by other people and it will be falsifiable or could be proven to be false. When designing experiments, it is important to control the variables. An experiment would be best designed by testing only one variable. For example, if testing plant growth, all plants would receive the same amount of light, the same amount and type of soil, but different amounts of water. If two of these variables would were changed, it would be difficult to determine which variable actually impacted growth. A well-designed experiment should have a control group that would be the group with no changes made to it. The experimental group would be the ones where the variable is changed. So group A would be the control where no changes were made. If giving the plant half a cup of water daily was normal, that's what the control group would get. Group B would be the first experimental group where they would only receive a quarter cup of water every day, while group C would be the second experimental group and they might receive one cup of water every day. Water was the only variable changed in this case. There are two main categories of science. The basic sciences, which research to further our knowledge while applied sciences take that known information in conjunction with technology to solve problems. When a researcher has successfully completed an experiment, they will want to share their results. Scientists use a peer-reviewed process where their work is reviewed by other experts in the field. Now that we have concluded Chapter 1, be sure to go back to the online textbook and review the questions provided. These will be the types of questions you can expect to see on your exam.